in it, but you know what. Um, uh, tired, my mind needs to get a back ache. Uh, just sitting here waiting for my turn to come, I got a back ache, okay? So, that, I mean, if that's leadership, well, you know, you're welcome to it. Um, you know, the, uh, the other thing is, that I, I want you up front, okay? Um, I have a foul mouth. Um, I say things I probably shouldn't be saying. Um, and like my children always say, Ma, it's so hard to raise good parents. Um, <laughs> because they don't, they can't take me in polite company. Uh, because they know I'm going to swear or do something stupid and they're going to get terribly embarrassed. So don't always think that parents know what they want to do or what they're doing is right. And I have learned that. And that's why I think I am the way I am. Because I learned, my, my mentors, you're right, mentors. Mentors are very important. My mentors are Lupe Fiasco. I think he's a kick ass. <laughs> now, if you don't know who Lupe Fiasco is, you're obviously son who does freestyle rap. My 15 year old daughter, who I don't know what she does, but she doesn't talk to me because I'm part of it for her. But those are the people I learned from. And one of the things I've learned to do over, the, over, over my life is to recognize that you don't become a leader because you want to be a leader. You know what? I'm so glad you have ambitions about yourself. But you know what? You become a leader when somebody else tells you they like you and they'd like to follow you. Because you're not. Actually, you're not. You do what you have to do and if two people like you and they join you and start to join your struggle, welcome to it, Mr. and brother. But if you think leadership is, I'm going to go to school, I can speak in a particular way, I dress the right way, that's not leadership, that's buying favors. That's hypocrisy and buying favors. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a leader, I never wanted to be a leader. I just got a big mouth. That's all. I'm not a leader, I'm a follower. You know what I follow? I follow a good cause. I follow social justice. I follow injustice till I turn it into justice. And I follow a basic principle in life, which is something my father taught me when I was knee high, and I had thought at that time, of course, my father, what the hell would he know? I know everything, right? That if you, um, now he, he was a religious man, so he, would, he said it in <coughs> more religious terms than I would have said it, but nevertheless, he said to hurt someone, is a, is a sin. But to watch someone get hurt and do nothing about it is a greater sin. Mm. And I live my life according to that. I don't stop to think, oh, can I help you? Are you a Muslim? Are you a woman? Are you a Pakistani? Are you 15 years old? No, I don't put qualifications to people's pain. If I can do something, I do it. I can't do it, walk away. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't turn around and say, I'm going to do this shit because, you know, I'm a Muslim, so I'm going to just help Muslims. Well, you know what? There's a lot of pain going around. And just take the quick, you know, if you don't realize what you're on about, you will recognize it from a simple fact. When 9-11 happened, the first call I got was from my friend, who's the executive director of the African Canadian Legal Clinic. Uh, welcome to the world of racial profiling. <coughs> a black woman. I'm like, that's a lot of <laughs> Just the experience I was missing. <laughs> but you know something what that brought that was brought home to me. <laughs> Can't do two things at the same time. Um, obviously not good at multitasking. <coughs> but one of the things that brought brought home to me was where the hell were you? when black people were being racially profiled? Where the hell were you when Aboriginal people are being profiled on a daily basis? Where the hell are you when other people get profiled? No, you can't do wait for 9-11 before you become familiar with racial profiling? That's not goddamn social justice. That's not leadership. That's convenience. All this creativity and everything. Yeah, she's right. Creativity is not only as creative as it is made out to be. You and I are equally creative. The point is, what is this creativity?
to be poor? Why the hell do you want to be creative? Who cares? Like what? What? Why? Why? Do you, what? Do you, what? What? What is? What is going to change because you became creative? You have a bigger bank balance. Thank you very much. I can sleep so well now. <laughs> you get a bigger, you know, you get a bigger paycheck. You get have, have get to have a fancy car. You get to live in a big home. Oh, thank you, sir. Your creativity has changed my life. Hello. <laughs> creativity is meaningless. She was talking about thinking about things differently. Yes, but it's not a technical issue. I'm crazy at my age. Look at the way I am. I can't even stop still. I move around. My children get embarrassed because I'm so animated. But one thing I'll tell you. My kids don't need training and empowerment. They see it on a daily basis in their lives. Not because I'm so great, I got up one day and I said, let me do some leadership training so I can be a leader. Hell no! It's because I realized that as an immigrant, as a woman, as a woman of color, and as someone who had certain advantages in the society because I can speak English language in a way better than white people can, or maybe not, but at least they understand it, because I have a public persona that is much more acceptable to the mainstream population than maybe somebody else, that I need to do something about it. What's the point of having these advantages if you can't do something to change somebody else's life? You know, the problem with all of us is that we walk around in this capitalist environment as these isolated, glorified individuals, and if it matters, we are historyless, we are unconnected to what is going on in the rest of the world. We are living in a country like Canada, which is a terrible pluralistic society. And we think we invented social justice when 9-11 happened. I mean like, <laughs> excuse me, last I heard Canadian history is based on two highly, highly racialized incidents of oppression. One is transatlantic slave trade, and the other is the genocide of Aboriginal people. So don't tell me the 9-11 made you aware of social justice. I think it illustrates commitment very well. There's a chicken and a pig walking down the street, right? They see a sign that says, ham and eggs for $3.99. So the chicken goes to the pig, you know, let's go. Cheap. That thing goes, well, you, for you it's just a contribution, for me it's a commitment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Are you making a commitment? Which means you may have to lay down yourself? Or are you making a contribution? Because contribution, last I heard, was only for your benefit. Commitment! Maybe for larger benefits, because you'll be the last person who benefits from it. So don't get carried away by the fact that now that you've gone through a leadership summit, you've become leaders. No, all you have become is aware. And that's what I'm saying. You look at the right? Conflict dynamics. That's what he talks about. And it's not that I'm not going to go by myself a little pinky, you know, by a little diamond. I just want you to know, I want you to be aware that when you buy a diamond, there is some child killing off a whole village in Angola, Sierra Leone, where the diamonds come from. That's what I'm saying. Deep into your soul and finding out a couple of things. Are you being honest? Are you being self-critical? Are you complicit in somebody else's pain? And if so, do you have the honesty and the integrity to not only stand up and own it, but to actually do something about it? Are you willing to go over and beyond contribution to commitment? Are you willing to say to yourself, I may not benefit from this, but at least somebody else will, and that somebody else doesn't have to be your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters and your friends and your family and your community. Can it be just another person who is in pain? Are you willing to do it for a Jew? Are you willing to do it for a Hindu? Are you willing to do it for a 
blacksmith and for a pickmith and for a Russian. The point is, you've got to be honest with yourself. And I know I'm in your face. And you may turn around and say, man, never in my life going to get that. That's okay. <laughs> there are six million people in Toronto. They still haven't found out about me. Poverty rate amongst white Caucasians went down by 28%. But amongst racialized people, it went up by 361%. You know what? If you get two meals a day, consider yourself lucky because I know people who don't. Do you know that food banks right now are overwhelmingly being accessed by people who at least have one full secondary degree? They're too ashamed to let you know the problem with immigrants is, unlike, you know, I don't know about Canadian government thinks we come here because we want to live in the luxurious, luxurious lap of welfare. But I hate to tell the government, welfare sucks. It's not luxurious. As an immigrant, it's not great ambition on my part to come all this way to live on welfare. In fact, it's just the opposite. Immigrants and racialized people are way, way too embarrassed to tell anybody what is happening to them. The fact that their skills are not getting translated into skills commensurate employment, the fact that their standard of living is going down, the fact that they are feeling demeaned and their children's future is not what it used to be because they used to do better and now they are not. This is, this is the common trend that I see as I do my work with immigrants and refugees in the past 18 to 20 years. You need to get involved with children who are in school, I, you know, who can't make it to university, not because they're not bright enough, but because the cost is prohibitive. Because high schools are not preparing color, you know, kids of color in such a way that they can actually access high school education. Where Safe Schools Act was being used as a punitive device to suspend black kids. Those are the kinds of things you need to look at. You need to look at how the connection between race, immigration, and refugee status, class, is all coming, and poverty is all coming.